but also municipal politicians, as I know the SFU City program takes great delight when we think we can help contribute to a conversation by sharing information with politicians. Now, I know if, you, if I can embarrass some of you, maybe you can identify yourselves. Marianne Booth from the District of West Vancouver, Greg Cameron, Robin Hicks from District North Vancouver is here. Adrian Carr, I believe, is here, or if she's not, she will be. Anyway, other uh, municipal politicians with us? Yes? Susan Chappelle. Uh, Susan Chappelle, all the way from Squamish. Thank you very much for coming down. Anyway, uh, one of the things that uh, I love doing is traveling, and is People, like most of you, it's hard not to take a look at what's going on around you when you see these different places. And uh, so what I'd like to do tonight is share with you some pictures that have been taken over a number of years, hopefully so that we can learn some lessons from what the Europeans do very well and apply those lessons to our region. And I have far too many pictures, so I'm going to move right into it and start off with the fact that I know what you're thinking because my distant cousin can read minds too. <laughs> and the question of course is, why am I suddenly a convert to the benefits of low and mid-rise housing when I of course love high-rise buildings just as much? And indeed, when I first came to Vancouver with CMHC in the 70s, I lived in the Martello Tower. I then was the very first resident of the International Plaza, even before it was completed. And indeed, over the years, I've been involved with the development of a number of towers, many of which have been quite controversial. Um, this one in Point Grey was the first high-rise that was approved in over 40 years, and the last high-rise that was approved <laughs> in over 30 years. And for those of you who weren't around Point Grey in Vancouver in the late 80s, an interesting issue at that time was the whole question of selling apartments in Vancouver to offshore residents. And it became a story in Vancouver that residents, people who lived here, couldn't buy these apartments. And so I made a, a deal because somebody bought this entire building, filled in all the balconies, but one of the conditions of the sale was that he had to sell them to the people who were on our list uh, first. And in fact, about a third of the building sold very quickly to local residents at prices that were dramatically higher. But it was only when I opened the Vancouver Sun one day, I discovered that in fact the company that had bought the entire building was the company that was featured in the novel The Noble House, Jardine Matheson. So I was actually quite flattered, to, to, to say the least, and in fact, it worked very well. Another high-rise development I worked on was Langara Gardens, which again is back in the news. In this case, a rental complex, Morris Wasp, the late Morris Wasp who owned it, wanted to move from his house to an apartment and thought it would be nice to live on top of one of his buildings. And uh, in order to live on top of one of his buildings, we have to get approval for the other 17 floors. Um, and we did, over George Pule's dead body. The irony is the biggest challenge was Morris wanted to know where his parking spaces were, and I said, well, you've got three spaces right next to the elevator in the underground garage, and he said, we can't, that won't work. My wife won't go into an underground garage. You have to get me some surface parking garages. I said, Morris, we don't normally do parking garages at the base of high-rise buildings, but if you look at the bottom right, we did sneak two in. The only thing I said is I'd like to cover them with brick or have the guy who paints your faux marble to paint it to look like brick. <laughs> he said it's too expensive, we'll paint it brick color. And then he put big signs saying, please don't park in front of my garages. <laughs> <clears throat> After that was finished, Morris decided he wanted to build another building and some city staff may recall that the thought was, look, why do one Let's look at Langara Gardens comprehensively. There was potential for three more high-rises. In fact, the community was very, very opposed. And uh, in the end, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the planning department supported it, um, the, the project was turned down. 
Uh, in fact, the mayor didn't even forward it to public hearing because of the supposed level of community objection. And I mention that because that, to, to a certain degree, is what tonight is about. To recognize the fact that even today it's difficult to get approval for high rises in many single family neighborhoods. But perhaps we can get some of these alternative forms of higher density approved. Um, over the years, I've been involved in a couple of other high-rise buildings, some condominiums that some of you will recognize in downtown South, and also the Bayshore project that I spent 10 years. I even recall fighting with then Councillor Gordon Price over the height of some of those buildings. I wanted them much taller. He wanted them uh, in accordance with the official community plan, which I thought was a very simplistic approach. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, in the end, I think we collectively agreed that it turned out quite well. The only thing is, at one point, I wanted a high-rise coming out of the marina. And we could do it because that marina was owned by the Bayshore Hotel. And I'd seen a tower coming out of the water uh, in eastern Canada. And in compensation, because we were seen to be privatizing the water, we offered to build a public pier at the extension of Denman Street and an Amsterdam bridge. And I was explaining this to the Consul General of the Netherlands, who I'm pleased to see in the back row. Thank you so very much for coming. You may not be aware of this, but your country will be featured in tonight's uh, presentation. Anyway, we never got a chance to build the pier, and we never built the Amsterdam Bridge, because the council vote was 10 to 1 against a tower in the water, Councillor Price being one of the 10. But Tung Chan should be recognized as having the vision. One of the interesting conversations about Bayshore was when you are designing, whether they're high-rise or low-rise, like how much sameness is okay? And this is a conversation that came up the other night, and I thank Jim Chang for this, because Jim Chang, I think, shocked a number of people when he asked the question, is it necessarily a bad thing for buildings to look the same? And I raise that now because that's something I'd like you to think about throughout this presentation. And perhaps we can start with this picture, which many of you will recognize as an aerial view of an area in Barcelona known as Leidshavl. I don't know how to pronounce it, but what I do know is it doesn't mean example or demonstration. What it means is expansion, because this area was the expansion area from the old town of Barcelona in the mid-19th century into the 20th, early 20th century. And it's quite an interesting pattern of development with these large super blocks where you get private space sort of inside the donut, which was a similar attitude that we use in the planning of the South Shore of False Creek. The other thing, which if you can see it, is at every intersection, the corners of the buildings are chamfered to create little mini squares. And I think it's a very, very intriguing design approach. But the point is, this is very much, I think, a European approach, and you're going to see a lot more buildings like it. And people often ask me, so why is it? Why is it that the European cities are so very different than the North American cities? And I think it has to do with history. And so let's go back about 150 years. This is Vancouver. Actually, it's Metro Vancouver, and some of you may recognize that's New Westminster. Now let's take a look at Paris around the same time. Actually, Let's look at Paris today. There's plenty of seats down here at the front, uh, Councillor Carr. I think it's fantastic, isn't it? Does anybody recognize this city? We'll come back here in a little while. There it is. Again, a few towers, but not very many. A carpet of low and mid-rise buildings throughout, uh, throughout the downtown area. Amsterdam, and of course, uh, today, fantastic. It really is. Uh, and if you look in all of that, you don't see very many buildings over 10 stories. And hopefully we can have a conversation why. And another of the cities that we'll feature tonight, 
Hamburg. And again, today, some high-rises, but predominantly low and mid-rise buildings, but at a density, as you'll see, which is comparable to many of the high-rise districts that we're building today. Now, I, I'm not going to spend much time on England. I was born in England, and so I grew up with semi-detached houses and terraced houses, and that's one view, and this is another view of a slightly more upmarket neighborhood. But if you haven't been to London recently, I know Michael Mortensen is here, just returned from London, but this is what it looks like now. Maybe we can discuss whether or not that's improved the city or not. Now, because Andy Yan is now the uh, heading up this city program, and he's obsessed with data, and I appreciate the fact he's so restrained. I know that you wanted to give a full presentation on the latest census data tonight, and I think it's very considerate of you not to, at least at the beginning, but I'm sure you will later on. But I actually was hoping you'd let us know what percentage of people in Metro Vancouver live in apartments. Is a, one thing I would guess is it's certainly lower than 46% which is the average of all the EU countries. Um, in, in the EU, they also group together semi-detached and row houses or townhouses, and it's about 22%. But there's still, if you look at all of the EU countries, about 30% of the people live in detached houses. But again, it's the cities that we're looking at today where the number of detached houses in the inner city are very, very small. One of the other things I was interested in is, well, how does the tenure compare? Um, overall, the tenure is very similar. I think it's about 70% uh, home ownership, and in Canada, I think it's somewhere around 68 to 70%. About 20% uh, people living in market rental housing, and just over 10% living in what they call reduced rent or free rental housing. And for those of you who are struggling to rent homes in Vancouver, if you have a European passport, you may want to find one of those countries. In fact, Andy, this next slide is for you. Nobody can see it at the back. But what it is, is the percentage of owner-occupied, mortgage-free homes versus the percentage of rental apartments versus the percentage of free rent apartments, and the yellow being the number of owner occupied homes with no mortgage, and some of you may want to move to Romania. Because I can't believe the statistic, but it's an official EU statistic. 95% of Romanians own their home mortgage-free. What is more interesting, I think, though, is that about half of the German population are renters. And in Switzerland, it's 64% of the population rents. So it's quite surprising. So for those of you who are going to be renting for the rest of your life, don't feel that you're a second-class citizen. You can just tell people that you're doing it because your grandparents were either German or Swiss, and it's a tradition that runs in the family. <laughs> One of the interesting things is we tend to think of the higher floors as being the more expensive floors. But whether you're in Amsterdam or St. Petersburg or most cities, it's in fact the more expensive housing is on the lower floors and it's the cheaper housing on the upper floors because of course when these homes were built they didn't have elevators. Here's another look at the kind. So in fact you see the grander windows on the lower levels and uh, more modest windows generally speaking, on, on the upper floors. And uh, if you've been to the Netherlands recently, you know that it really is a place where there's some very, very creative housing. And when you get the Georgia Strait this week, you'll see a story about uh, the use of containers as a form of building. And that building on the top left is actually constructed entirely from containers. The one in the middle, is not just constructed from containers, but is designed to look like it was constructed from containers. <laughs> and if you go along 900 block East Hastings, you'll see a building there that looks very similar to the one in the middle. And I know it got approved for a very high density and rushed through the urban design panel because of the originality of the design. 
even though it was simply a copy of a Netherlands architectural piece. But the point is, it is worthwhile to travel and see what's going on because I think that's what we do as architects and planners and builders, is take the best ideas from other places. Just wanted to include this one on the top right, a very innovative, to my mind, way of integrating a new building and an old building by literally piggybacking over the building. And I had to put the picture in the middle because, in fact, it was the Dutch government that paid for me to tour the country for a week and take many of the pictures that I'm going to share with you. Others I took this past summer when I toured with uh, Richard Enriquez, who's, who's known to many of you. But again, it's quite, I mean, I'm not sure if everybody likes this or not, but I can't help but be fascinated by the fact that they can generally zone for a certain density and a certain height, and in this case, a bit more architectural variety, but people respect the guidelines. If this was Vancouver, somebody would take that middle building and seek a demolition permit, offer to put some social housing in it, and then seek an FSR of about 17.6. <laughs> but not there. This is an interesting development. It's actually in a natural lake, and uh, the number of islands, the six islands have been created so far, another four to be created, and a whole variety of housing. But as you can see, not a high-rise in sight. But my favorite street in this development is this one. And this is the idea that I hope that some of you can bring to Vancouver. Although Jim McIntyre, the director of planning and co Quitman, who's here tonight, tells me that he is now approving and facilitating fee simple row houses. And by that I mean individual row houses that are not part of a condominium. Now what's different about this development than what's being built in Coquitlam at the moment is in Coquitlam it's an individual developer who comes along, builds the homes, and then afterwards they then design, divide the land up, they basically design the subdivision plan so the land under each townhouse is owned fee simple. And there's, there's no condominium, there's no strata, there may be some common elements, but it's not the same as all of those townhouse developments we see in Richmond, Surrey, Langley, and so forth. I would say Vancouver, but you don't really see a lot of new townhouse developments. But here what's interesting is these aren't built by developers. An individual comes along just as somebody would buy a lot on 33rd on the west side or east side of Vancouver and build a detached house. Here you come along and you build a terraced house, a row house. And sometimes you'll have separate walls between the homes or if they're both being built at the same time, sometimes they'll even share the party wall and have a legal agreement covering it. And I think this is an idea that we really should look at because it provides a form of housing that many people want. It's ground oriented. In this case, some of these are three, four stories in height, but you'll notice they have no front yards. Now I personally think this would be better if there had been a little bit of a front yard, but if you think about it, if you can eliminate that 25 foot front yard and then take the width of a 33 foot lot and multiply that together times three, you suddenly begin to realize you can create the equivalent of a large home just by reducing the front yard of that development. Now in this particular area, not only do they have these row houses along the street, but they're doing something quite innovative in the backyard. Along the lane, these are their version of laneway houses. And they're obviously larger, they're both for sale and for rent. But I think this is quite an intriguing way. You're the ending up at densities at 2 FSR and sometimes even higher, but with every unit being a ground-oriented town home. In some places along the lane, they're actually building laneway row houses. And again, in certain parts of our city, this is an idea that could make sense. And I shouldn't say our city, I should say our region. Because everything I'm saying tonight, well, I may sound awfully Vancouver-centric. There's plenty of seats up here at the front. Um, in fact, these are ideas that I think have application throughout the region. 
Now, it's not all like this, as you saw in the aerial photographs. Some of the buildings are much larger, much higher densities. One of the things that I noted here is they don't have a lot of balconies, but what they have is those Juliet balconies, so the sliding doors open up, so it helps bring the outside in. Uh, on the whole question of, you know, is there anything wrong with sameness, I thought of Jim Chang when I inserted this picture. But I, again, I think it's quite fantastic. Uh, not as fantastic as this. I've always been fascinated by floating homes. This is a floating clustered housing development in the lake. It's tidal, so they do go up and down. From the air, they look something like this. And if you look, you'll notice that they're clustered. So there's some units that are three, there's some semi-detached or two, and there's also some single units. And as I was reading the brochure that the Dutch government gave me, I discovered that they gave these individual cluster of houses names. And I wanted to share that with you. You won't be able to see this. But the triplexes, they're known as the Seattle model. <laughs> the duplexes are known as the Sydney model, and sure enough, the large single family detached <laughs> model is called the Vancouver model. <laughs> and I'm not making this up. But again, what an idea. A portion of the development actually is on land, that's where the parking is, and then you get these units. And uh, I just hope that over time we can convince Port Metro Vancouver and other jurisdictions to make better use of our water because I know that the people who do live in these floating home communities in Vancouver and around the region have a great sense of community and enjoy it very much. So here's another Dutch experiment that I wanted to share. Taking this idea of building your house some of the people were saying, you know, it's great what we're doing, but I think maybe we have too much regulation. And somebody came forward with the notion, what if we cast aside many of our design regulations and said to people, provided you meet the building code, safety, fire requirements, you can do whatever you want. And so they did. They bought a piece of land from the government. And when I was there, I asked the government, I said, you seem to have a lot of land. How come? They said, we make it. <laughs> <laughs> and they made this. This is outside of Amsterdam, in a, what was once a new 1970s town called Almera. A master plan, as you can see in, in the corner. And then over time, people came along, bought a lot, and just built their own house. And uh, as you can see, it's slowly filling up and uh, starting to attract attention. And I was quite surprised this past August when I came across a story in Maclean's magazine talking about what Canada could learn from a Dutch self-built housing movement. And in case you can't read the fine print, it said, could Vancouver be next? And sadly, I think I'll have to say, Vancouver is not likely to be next unless there's a major attitudinal shift in the minds of many municipal officials and uh, politicians. But it's not everyone's cup of tea. I personally don't like the architecture. But in a way, when I was looking at it, I couldn't help think that maybe this is a modern day version of the approach that was used when they built 17th century Amsterdam. Now, before we leave the Netherlands, my wife wanted me to show you this development, just to prove the Dutch really are nuts. How many of you have seen this one? <laughs> yes, that's right. The Curious Cube Houses of Rotterdam. And again, <clears throat> it's not what I would call an economy of means, but uh, it's fascinating development. Of course, uh, Richard Enriquez was curious to know what do they look like inside. But when he saw how steep the staircase was to get up there, he let me pay the three euros to go up and look inside. 
And so I'm going to save you three euros by showing you what you would find. It's a bit of a struggle to make some of the uh, rooms work, <laughs> but what a novelty uh, experience. And some of you, if you know Toronto, will say, just a second, isn't there one of these down by in the downtown? And, and there is. Anyway, we're going to leave the Netherlands and go to France. Not Paris this time, but on the advice of my friend Chuck Brook, who's here tonight, I went to Montpellier to see some of the new development there. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, the, one of the most impressive developments, I thought, was one called Parc Marianne, which is uh, labeled as an eco quartier. Again, um, mid-rise planning throughout, no towers, just as little focal points. Um, and, uh, and the way it looks uh, today, it's not fully finished. But what I found interesting was the variety of architectural design and also this very sustainable landscaping. And any of the landscape architects in the room will know, I mean, when we study landscape architecture, the French were always uh, associated with these strong formal gardens. But here it's the kind of very <coughs> natural uh, landscape with lots of weeds that we find in Vancouver as we approach the Burrard Street Bridge. <laughs> but just some of the architectural treatment and some very innovative use of materials uh, and quite a bit of variety. And I, I was debating whether or not to simply put up the generic Vancouver building that we all know with four stories that you see almost everywhere where there's sometimes it's four stories all the way for the inset balconies sometimes the top floor is set back uh, some of them I think are very very uh, attractive especially those in, uh, in the uh, Arbutus Walk development but after a while I must say I think if some of the new buildings that we're proposing had a little bit more of the charm and variation of these, people would appreciate them. And again, at the top left, that's actually a ceramic exterior that's extruded and it just creates a wonderful texture. The top right one, that's actually concrete, painted concrete, but with a decorative uh, pattern. Um, the bottom right is actually metal panels and, uh, and then in the middle, uh, bottom left, just some very interesting paving. Perhaps they've gone a little bit overboard and you may not be able to see this at the back, but for the developers in the room, here's a very clever project name you can copy from the French. It's Atmosphere. <laughs> and before we leave Montpellier, I have to uh, show you the city hall. I did get a, a meeting arranged with the planner who oversaw this development, but once I got there, I was just so impressed with this city hall. Uh, Jean Nouvel is the architect, that top right picture is the lobby, and on the lobby they've created the sort of mural effect of all the documents related to the founding of the city. And I couldn't help but think, it's just like the Vancouver City Hall. <laughs> <laughs> but different. <laughs> okay, let me take you to Germany, and I'm going to show you three developments in Germany. The first is Hoffen City. How many of you have been to Hoffen City? Okay, well that's good. We're going tonight. Um, I also want to just show you some developments I saw in an international building exposition also in Hamburg. And by the way, when we travel, I don't do it as much now as I used to, but in Hamburg we actually did a house exchange. And so that way, I, I'm a great fan of house exchanges in the yes. city, at least in Europe. So the uh, Hamburg waterfront, of course, has great history, uh, all lots of warehouses and industrial activity, and a very, very large area was uh, identified <coughs> as ripe for redevelopment. So 388 acres is a very large piece. That's almost twice the size of the Pacific Place Concord development. <coughs> the, um, when, I, when I was there this summer, it was reported to me that there were about 57 projects completed, another 50, another 50 under construction or about to get under construction. 
There's about 7,000 residential units, of which about 2,000 are social housing units. And one of the most interesting buildings there is the new Philharmonic Hall that many of you would have read about. And it's designed by Herzog and de Meuron, who, as you may recall, were selected to be the architects for the Vancouver Art Gallery. And let's just hope that the Vancouver Art Gallery does not suffer the same fate as this building, since at least according to one German newspaper I read, it took 10 years longer to complete than planned and cost 10 times as much as initially planned. But the low-rise and mid-rise building scale, again, sometimes it may seem almost unrelenting, <coughs> but in the case of Hoffman City, it, there are some variations, as I'll show you. But I did want to just show, again, some ideas in terms of details. In this case, sliding screens, shutters. We're starting to see sliding screens in some of the Vancouver architectural projects. There's a naughty building in uh, downtown South, <coughs> designed by Hudson Barker. <coughs> but uh, I've often wondered, why don't we use these exterior shutters in, in our buildings, as they do throughout, throughout Europe? But this is one of the high-rises. One of the, this is, there's two high-rises, plus the concert hall in the, in the community, and they obviously try to do something a little different. The um, IBA, this was the headquarters for the exhibition, um, modular floating modules. I mean, how could I not want to go and see that? And the community was built as a demonstration project. So a variety of different buildings, each one demonstrating something different, but all very much with a focus in either environmental sustainability or uh, or, or on affordability. So just looking at a, taking a closer look at six of the buildings, or five of the buildings, um, one of them is very much focused on price, the other demonstrating how modular construction can be used. Um, the bottom left is the soft house, I'm going to take you in there in a minute. And the one on the right, which was developed by a consortium of consultants, by the way, have you ever thought about what might be a good collective noun for consultants? I was thinking, how about an expense of consultants? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this building, as it says, is powered by algae. And it's those panels at the bottom there. And some of you will understand this much better than I will. But it's quite intriguing. I was more fascinated by the soft house where the panels, these are solar panels, but they actually adjust their orientation depending on the location of the sun. It's not really my cup of tea architecturally, but it's quite intriguing. And those are four townhouses. Uh, one of the other things, though, uh, some interesting uses of exterior materials and uh, lots of attempts at uh, green roofs and sloping green walls and green angled walls. And again, just another view. And, and this will stay there as, as a community of these demonstration homes. And again, some are more attractive than others. One of the things about this particular complex is you'll notice the wires on the exterior and the planting that grows up. And that's something I saw a lot of in Germany. The, the other thing, though, was this notion of a floating apartment building. And at first I thought, how can you have a floating apartment building and then I remember that some of these new cruise ships really are floating apartment buildings. To be honest, this one is not floating. It was just designed to look like it was floating because they didn't have the, uh, the time and the opportunity in terms of space to do everything that they would have needed to do. But this is happening elsewhere in Germany. I now want to take you south, though, to Freiburg. <laughs> By the way, if you want to go to Freiburg, maybe I can uh, let you benefit from my misadventure. I wasn't actually aware that there are two Freiburgs in Germany. <laughs> one was in East Germany and one was in West Germany. The good news is we went to the right one. The bad news 
is that our hotel is in the other one. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the flagship developments in, in Fryberg. And if anybody wants, I'm happy to uh, figure out a way that all these photographs can be made available to you. So we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to do that. But this is a building. You can see the roof is a series of uh, extensive solar panels. It's a mixed-use development with residential, above office, above retail. And I do hope you all appreciate how long I had to stand there and wait for the colors of the train cars to match perfectly the panels on the building. But this, speaking of something on the building, this intrigued me. I saw this building with these faces uh, sort of etched onto the panels of the balconies. And I said, are these the residents? And they said, no, these are the people who built the building. And I was thinking, would I want to live with a photograph of the guy who built my building for the next... Anyway, it's an intriguing, very, very creative idea. And again, as you go through Freiburg, uh, this is Vauban, a suburb of Freiburg, and uh, there's no parking under any of these buildings. There are parking garages on the outside of the town, and that's where you park. Uh, that's where you park your car. It's just visitors and delivery vehicles that can go in, in, into the town. And speaking of delivery vehicles, while I was there, I saw the oil truck pull up. And I thought, what kind of sustainable community is this? The oil truck is here. Until I looked carefully and I read what was on the side and I realized that's not the oil truck. That's the pellet truck delivering wood pellets which are used to as the heating source for many of these buildings. Um, one of the other things I particularly liked, if you look on the right side of this, is the fact that they don't just bury the stairs inside the building and lock them up and leave them in a raw concrete state. They celebrate the staircases and people use them. And uh, <coughs> indeed, in one hotel I was at, on the doors of the elevators, it actually said, if you're thinking about having a pastry at dessert, maybe you should take the stairs. <laughs> Those Dutch. But I love this picture of this very healthy looking German family, and I love the color of the buildings, and I was thinking, is there really anything wrong with color? And the Germans feel the same way. Now, for those of you who wonder, do the Germans always dress like this? Looking at the top right picture, no. But every year in Hamburg, they do have an event to celebrate the 70s. <laughs> it's a good time to go. Just taking a look though from the top, all of the, uh, all the new buildings have completely solar panel roofs. And I think it's just a matter of time before we'll be doing that here. They're also retrofitting all of the older uh, buildings uh, as time goes by. But I just wanted to finish off uh, Germany with a look at another technological advancement. Why do I have a picture of a toilet in my presentation? Because this is no ordinary toilet. It's not one of those Japanese toilets that shoots the warm air and water. <laughs> this toilet does something different. I won't even let you think about what it might be. I'll show you. It self-cleans the seat. <laughs> We're going to finish off with uh, the tour of Denmark. And I'd like to first take you to Aarhus, which is the second largest city. Then we'll go to Copenhagen and look at Orstad, which is the suburb where you're going to see much of the very creative work from uh, the Art Ingels. And then uh, just a couple of pictures from the final, uh, the latest development on the waterfront. So we were walking along the street with no idea what we were about to see. And this is what we found. And uh, I'm sure you can imagine what they call this project. And if you think, do they call it the icebergs? You're absolutely right. And uh, it's a, a mixture of market and non-market rental 
market ownership and non-market rental housing. And it's really quite spectacular to look at. Whether or not it makes a lot of sense in terms of maximizing the value of materials, we can debate. I certainly don't think it does. But this is what seems to be happening now in Denmark with more and more buildings going to various lengths to create something that's not only different, but something that can be quite attractive. Although it, it was an aspect of this building complex that I didn't think was attractive, and that was how it hit the street. And I remember Brent uh, Tottering gave a talk about Danish architecture, and he made that point too, that the buildings are great except for the ground plane. And uh, I, I, I couldn't quite find out why that was. Next to this development, we saw this new complex. And again, with an exterior material that we had to go and look and see whether it was a ceramic or metal or painted concrete, it was really very difficult to tell. The quality of the construction was really quite fantastic. And again, there's a variety. I mean, these buildings, if you like, these are short high rises, um, much more modest buildings. But some interesting ideas uh, in the top right. I thought that you know, one of the debates when we do balconies, in the old days we always had upstands. Today people want don't anything to block the view. But invariably balconies end up with a lot of bicycles and storage and boxes. So then the question is, is there something you can do? In Burnaby, they used to want to encourage you to use a kind of fettered glass to sort of uh, shade it a bit. But I thought this was an intriguing approach where, you, as you can see, it's uh, various shades of tinted glass. The bottom building is just showing a, a metal lattice up the outside of that building. And in doing a little bit of research for this talk, I came across what is the latest award-winning scheme for this area, and I thought it was really is quite fantastic. And it will be built because as many of you, as I'm about to show you, there are other buildings as equally as as complex. But just on that point, one of the observations made uh, by an architect who spent a lot of time in Europe and in Russia and here is why don't we have more competitions? And it's quite interesting how not only public buildings and complexes, but private complexes are designed and, and selected through competition. And maybe it's something we should discuss as to whether that's something that could perhaps contribute to a greater variety of, of design. This was a building I just happened to see floating around the Copenhagen waterfront. But I liked it because I'm intrigued with the idea of apartments where you have exterior access corridors. You know, for some, they're terrible because they're too reminiscent of the old English terraced apartments. But they can be very nicely done. There's some apartments in West Vancouver with exterior access corridors, which I think are just delightful. And certainly this one was, and there, were, in talk, uh, there was a sense of community along the, the, the corridors. That's where the kids play and so forth. And I think this morning I did an interview with Rick Clough, and he asked me, you know, what lessons, other lessons did I bring back? And one was how the Europeans think about families in high rise and, and in apartments, and mainly in apartments. And as more and more of our families with children are moving into apartments, I think it's important for us to think how best to accommodate them. The other thing is not every building is a look at me building, just as they're not here. And I, I didn't want to leave you with the impression that everything is so outrageous. And, but I thought these buildings had a quiet elegance that uh, could fit in very nicely in, in many other places. So now we'll go to Orstad and take a look at uh, some of the buildings that I suspect many of you are familiar with. Um, I must say, Engels, there's not many architects that I really get overwhelmed by, but he, I think there's, I'm impressed with how creative his work is, but also how he can ever convince someone to build it. <laughs> but look at this one. This is, of course, Eight House, and it's called Eight House because it's in the shape of a figure eight. 
and uh, it's got the sloping green roofs that are, I'll show you in a second. One of the other aspects of this is that there's portions of it that allow you to take your bicycle up to the upper floor suites on a system of ramps without taking it into the elevator. And at the base here, this one has a little restaurant where we had a delightful lunch. But I mean, it really is quite fantastic. And these are market condominiums. <clears throat> Another view. You want to know why the Danes are so fit? <laughs> and a view of part of that ramping system. And again, a large children's playground, an adventure playground in this case, at the base of the building. This is the one um, that's known as Mountain Dwellings. And it's a somewhat unique project because for whatever reason, they built the housing above a 480-car parking garage, which serves not this building, but indeed a number of the other commercial buildings in the general area. But again, from the side, you see a lot of these metal screens with public art. And I have to say, I much prefer this approach to public art than the letters that Ian Gillespie installed around the upper floors of the Pacific Rim Hotel. But I think this is quite, quite beautiful. If you look at the building, though, from the other side, it looks like this. And again, quite reminiscent of Habitat 67, where every twin, Moishe Safdie did create the concept of Habitat 67 in Montreal. The idea of these gardens in the sky. I think that this is something that a lot of people would really love. And I'm the first to admit it's tough to do in a wood frame building where you're worried about leaks. But in concrete buildings, you can do this. Um, whether or not you should always use wood, I don't think you should. Um, it's hard to see, but they use a lot of wood in the European buildings and it doesn't wear well. But uh, this is another one of his projects called the VM House, because sure enough, if you look at it from the air, one of the buildings is in the shape of V, and the other is in the shape of an M. And here is a different approach to balconies, and I think I could, you know, we can question these balconies in terms of whether they're providing a level of privacy that people might want. <laughs> but they sure look terrific. And you can't read that, but I had to put this line, I came across this in an article. Someone said, I would marry this building if I could. I felt the same way. And a piece of, uh, of art at the lobby. And again, uh, just a detail of the windows with all these narrow wood strips that are all fading. And I couldn't help but wonder, why do they do that? But uh, they look nice when they're new. And just a couple of other buildings. Again, these are not English buildings, but they're interesting, I think, in terms of trying to... Uh, to, to break up the mass, and as you can see, uh, as, it, as it is along the street. I know a lot of people will say, I don't like this at all, but I think this is something that would be easier to get approved in some communities than high-rise buildings. This might be a little more difficult, but it sure is interesting. Uh, a local architectural firm. And just to finish off then with a few more photos of those Ingalls buildings, and again, that bottom right one gives you a better look at the mountain dwellings. So finally, as we uh, leave Europe, this is the latest development. I just uh, got a car and started driving. <coughs> and I, uh, I, had, I had seen a presentation about this area, but I didn't know where it was or what it was called. And when I got there, in many respects, it looked quite ordinary compared to some of the other developments I'd seen. Um, some very dark, dark brick buildings and some fairly modest looking uh, towers and, and so forth. But I saw a building that really intrigued me, and I, although it's not really part of the theme, I wanted to show it to you. Because whenever we think about Copenhagen and transportation, we invariably we think of bicycles. And there are lots of bicycles. <laughs> But this building intrigued me because it's a parking garage, an above ground parking garage. And there inside you can sort of see the ramping. And then you look, and again, they've taken this metal screen 
And this is a photo I took when I was there, and it wasn't finished. I couldn't quite figure out exactly what was going on. But then I found in a magazine some illustrations of how it was intended to look when it was finished. And in fact, the idea is that the whole building becomes sort of a mix of sculpture and art and a green wall. But more importantly, on the top, there's a public park. And so it got me thinking, as we slowly move away from the parking requirements of yesteryear, many of the roof decks of parking garages are going to become empty. And while I would love to see some of them used for modular housing, or maybe some other uses, and we once talked about greenhouses on the roofs of one Vancouver parking garage. How did that one work out, Gregor? <laughs> but uh, the idea of taking the roof of uh, some of these buildings and creating public parks and green space to accommodate the increasing population, to my mind, is an idea that may well be worth, worth exploring. So this now brings me to the final part of this talk, which is what are some of the lessons from these places that we might apply to our region? And I think the first one is to go back to the idea that maybe we can look at the zoning map and start to replace all that white single family zoned area with new colors that allow you to build these individual row houses, these small apartment buildings, and mid-rise. And basically, I think the concept should be simple, which is the main arterials, depending on their importance, they might be six to eight stories, or they might be four to six stories. And then the block behind, then it scales down to the single family. And I'll never forget when Councillor Price uh, asked me as I stood before him, groveling, <laughs> to get approval for a rezoning on 41st Avenue, he actually said to me, Mr. Geller, first it was Oak Street, now it's 41st Street, why don't you come forward with a rezoning application on one of the other streets? I said, would you approve anything on 42nd Street? And he said, well, I think now I understand why you come forward with your rezoning. Actually, I wanted to do a project on 42nd Street because had I got it approved, I would have called it Miracle on 42nd Street. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea of these row houses, we could begin to fill in a lot of Metro Vancouver. Some would be built by developers, some will be condos, some will be individually owned, some of them can just be lots that are made available so that people can come in and build a house like they do in, 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 in the Netherlands. And again, it's time to rethink these setbacks. I'm just designing some, some housing right now in West Vancouver, and of course there's a 25-foot setback. And uh, I'm trying to think, like, how close could you get to the street and make, in fact, make people feel it's actually better than having a large unused garden? But, I was doing some calculations, and you can do it with me. Just think, if we could take all these 25-foot setbacks, whether it's by 33 feet or 50 feet, and just multiply that out in your mind, 33 by 25, and then multiply it by three, because you're going to put a three-story building on it, just think how many more, the equivalent of how many more housing units we could build just on the front yards of all of those west side and east side houses. And many years ago, Councillor Kerry Jang and I were judges for a modular housing <coughs> competition. And my favorite project was one where the applicants were proposing to fill in the front yards of west side houses with modular units. But they knew that many of the neighbors might not like it. So they came up with what I thought was a brilliant scheme. They designed the modular units so that they looked like large hedges. <laughs> and not only should we be looking at densifying along the street, we should also be looking at all of our parks and community centers because, again, these are such ideal places to live. And I don't think we need to go quite as far as they did in Central Park in New York. 
But to my mind, all of the, which, regardless of which municipality you're in, the land around parks and community centers, that's where people should congregate. And that's where we should be putting some, not necessarily, we won't put high rises, but maybe we can put some four story and five story mid rise buildings. And not just in Vancouver. I don't know how many of you recognize uh, this, but this is, uh, this is Port Moody. This is St. John Street. And again, it upsets me so much every time I go down these streets and I see single family <laughs> houses being built today. And I'm thinking, these areas should be rezoned. But the trouble is, and Chuck Brook will tell you this, it's so frustrating trying to rezone properties that after about 20 years of it, you have to move to the south of France. <laughs> <laughs> you just, it's like post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, I fortunately have not yet suffered it because I'm too insensitive, but what we need to do is let's not rely on the developers and their architects to come forward with proposals to rezone along these streets. The municipal planners should be changing the zoning designation in advance. Do it through a consultative process. Decide whether it's a three-story scale or a five-story scale, but pre-zone it, if I can use that silly word, and then people can come forward. And yes, we may have to deal with the BC Assessment Authority in terms of how we deal with the fact that these properties may go up in value and though an impact negatively on a single family homeowner. But it's not just St. John Street, since I was hoping somebody from West Vancouver would come, if you just take a look here along Marine Drive, <laughs> look at all those little single family houses. Wouldn't they be lovely as a row of three and four story apartments terracing down to the south? But I'm not going to take it on. <laughs> Too old. But one of you should. One of you should. So to conclude, I think there's a place for high rise. This is not a talk to say we shouldn't be building high rises. But in many neighborhoods, especially when we're close to single family, we're not going to get approval to build high rises but we could get approval to build some of these other low and mid-rise forms of housing. Now again, as I said at the beginning, I can read your minds, and some of you are saying, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> won't these, these buildings be more expensive? And yes, some of them will be more expensive, but if you want to explore that topic a little more fully, come back here on April 4th, because I'm going to do yet another talk about how to create affordable housing. But the thesis I'd like to put forward is that if we could start to rezone a lot of the single family neighborhoods, not just in Vancouver, but throughout Metro, then we could begin to moderate the price of housing through a significantly increased supply. So if you want to learn more about some of the projects that I featured tonight, um, I write this blog, and all of them have been featured at one time or another, and, uh, and I will continue to try to do my best to make photos and images available, because I often believe the best way to convince politicians and the public that something could work is by showing them what it will look like, even if it is somewhere else. So I hope you enjoyed listening to this as much as I enjoyed putting it together. Thank you all very much for coming and your attention.